So I got uh, a few uh, more things to, uh, I, I'm gonna talk about sort of uh, a little bit deeper into what I'm interested in researching, or one of the things I'm researching at the moment. Um, but first I wanted to see um, whether there are any of uh, uh, those um, inner secret um, uh, influences that any of you have that are uh, rearing their, their head as you go through life as an undergraduate at UCSD. Any, any uh, ideas where there might be connections between what you're interested in and things that are deep within your psyche and experience? Or that you would, that you would to share. So the silences can be read many ways. Um, but one of the ways is that it is um, actually quite difficult to narrativize uh, what I've just done. I've just given you a story. The story makes perfect sense from the, the now. It makes no sense from the before, right? So that's part of the point. Um, so I'm not saying that why don't you just go with the flow, but I am saying that um, uh, the, the things that shape you and the opportunities that come up are not things that you can predict. Um, let's just jump in here. So this is the website that I run. It's called Plains Ledger Art. It's plainsledgerart.org. You can all go look at it. Um, and basically, I've spent 20 some years, and this is one of a number of research things that I've been doing. Uh, but th I spent 20 some such years uh, going to universities, libraries, private collections, anywhere I can find them, and taking this kind of drawing, which is on paper, called ledger drawing. And it's called ledger drawing because the earliest examples were done by Plains Indian warriors on accountants' ledger books that they either got uh, in uh, rations as supplies from the military, or they took in raids, or they traded for. So um, this is on paper, and the paper that it's on is often um, you know, the old ledger books that have the columns where you you know, figure out numbers and write uh, histories of, of regiments and who's the best shot and whatnot. So this material is uh, scattered in institutions and private hands all over the world. Uh, some of it's outside of the US. And I've been um, basically archiving it on this site. Uh, it says there's 34 ledgers catalog. There are a bunch more in process. And I go and make uh, agreements with the institution. I physically scan this stuff sometimes. Sometimes they've already scanned it. And then it's, it's curated here. And the website has a bunch of research tools built in. So you can actually use it instead of visiting the originals, which are quite fragile. And we actually have some of the originals at Mandeville Special Collections in Guy's Library. And they basically come to UCSD because of this project. So even though this project was meant to be a digital project, meant to preserve the originals and allow people to use them wherever they were in the world, including uh, the, the tribal folks whose relatives actually did them, who rarely can travel to the museums that own them. Um, some of them have migrated here because of the digital project. Uh, so I am going to ask you a question. Here is an example of one of those drawings. And you can see it's on lined paper. And you can see here that it has the number, um, you know, of the, because those accounts, uh, accountants, ledger books were, were actually physically numbered. Um, so what's happening? It's an attack. An attack. A description of the colonization. Sorry? Illustration of colonization. Illustration of colonization. Um, a, an attack. Uh, so, but how do we read this? So clearly, it's a 
some sort of battle going on. Absolutely correct. And it's also um, connected to colonization, at least in some manner, uh, directly, I, I guess. Um, but how do we read this? What, 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 if we were trying to uh, think of what story this might be uh, showing, yeah? I think it would show an Indian chasing a soldier away. An Indian chasing a soldier away, okay, yeah. I think about the artist who drew it and their perspective. This looks like a child drunk, so I would assume a child was watching this happen. So uh, it looks like a child drawing, so yeah, you assume that a child uh, uh, was watching it happen. Um, okay, so what about some of these details? What do you think these guys are that are bringing all the way around on the margin? Sorry, guns and muskets. Yes, absolutely. Um, and you can see the puff of smoke. You see little puffs of smoke, so they're firing. And what they're firing are bullets, and the bullets are these. They look like polywogs because they're showing where the energy is going, right? So if you think about that already, that's a fairly sophisticated idea that they're showing uh, not that these bullets are going randomly, but that they have energy, that they are invested in some sort of energy. Um, okay, so uh, the Cheyenne guy, and this is Northern Cheyenne, uh, is chasing the uh, military guy with his saber, uh, his leggings, the little cap, platoon cap, um, and that's a, a military horse. This is a Cheyenne horse with the the uh, tail tied, which meant that it's a special war horse. Um, and the Cheyenne guy has his uh, shield and the horse is painted and you see the, uh, the uh, paint um, at the legs and perhaps at the head, although the head might have also been, been darker. So there is a way of reading these. Um, it tells us a lot about the Cheyenne. And these weren't drawn by Cheyenne children. They were drawn by warriors to tell their own story, uh, the story of a particular battle, which gave them a particular kind of, of social status and power. And in fact, these drawings were done often either by the person who did the exploit, so who had uh, chased ran down this cavalry, cavalry guy, or someone who was a, a really good drawer in the group who drew uh, the story according to the way in which it was narrativized. Uh, that meant that in every case, when these were drawn, they were communally agreed upon as something that actually <coughs> happened. So it's not just like you go in and make up a great story about yourself. Um, these are um, essentially part, these are owned by individuals and they have their value because they're agreed upon as something that happened in the past that gives the individual some status and uh, that honor and status redounds on the group as well because it actually happened. Okay, so we're going to learn how to read a ledger book. Some ledger books uh, pages are show double uh, drawings, and uh, so you see the account ledger book. This is a, a double page, and it gets a little bit complicated. So we're going to start just with one side. So you almost always read a ledger book from from uh, right to left. Uh, the protagonist, the good guy, is always on the right. Almost always. Sometimes I mean everything has exceptions, but almost always. Uh, and the person who's going to be um, attacked, vanquished, chased away, whatever is going to happen, killed, um, honorifically touched, uh, what the French call counting coup, uh, is, is generally on, on the left. And we know a lot of things um, by the way they're shown. So this is a Cheyenne warrior. Not only do we know this uh, because um, of where the pleasure book was collected, uh, um, at who, who might what group it might have been collected from, but because what people are wearing is absolutely distinctive. And there were conventions to make it clear who is who and what is what and what they're doing. So this is a Cheyenne warrior uh, because of the way he's dressed with these um, 
uh, uh, leggings that trail off of, of his trousers, uh, with the cap with the feather in it, which is a fur cap, um, probably mountain lion. Uh, we know this is a crow enemy because of that um, hairstyle, a pompadour uh, it's called, um, and then the, uh, the braids, which are often false, false hair on the back. He is in um, a military capote, so he is probably a scout or was a scout for the military, um, and the two are, are obviously clashing. Um, and then we already know that these are bullets because from the previous uh, one we looked at. Arrows are there, so not only bullets are flying at this time, but arrows as well. Um, and um, uh, we have the narrative suggesting exactly where this person came from. So he's come around to meet the Crow Warrior head on. Um, there are also some other really interesting details. So for example, that little thing up there, it's, up, it's kind of like uh, the bubble in a cartoon that has the, um, the, the, uh, um, the speech, a speech bubble, uh, but it's called a name glyph. That's a icon for the name of the warrior himself. So I think in this case, it's Roman nose, that big nose, he was called in English, Roman nose, they're Roman nose, and it's a coat of Roman nose, Shan Roman nose, so he's, he's Roman nose. Um, we have, we, this is a, a typical Cheyenne shield direct, um, uh, design, and these designs had power because they're connected to cosmological forces, forces that actually move the world. This is known as the Four Directions Shield. Um, the Crooked Bow Lance says something about this warrior. It says he was in a particular war society, and you get into a war society by doing great deeds like this one. Um, and the Crooked Bow Lance is one of the things that, that uh, society members carried that was a marker of that achievement. Um, and so I already talked about the Crow Pompadour. These things are extremely accurate, these drawings. We can tell by the way that rifle is drawn exactly what model it was. And sometimes you can tell the date of the battle or the exchange that's being depicted by identifying some of those, those details. So there's kind of historical detail here. It's about something that really happened. There were witnesses that bear witness that allow this to be drawn in the first place. Um, now, in a two-page drawing, uh, the um, action starts from the bottom of the right page, as it says, goes around to the top and on the left page. So if you think about it, the action that you're seeing here has been bent to form the double-page drawing. Um, so, uh, the, um, so, so basically, if following those tracks, uh, we're seeing the action here, this horse goes there, and then um, to where it is now, right? The way, uh, if it were unbent, it would look is kind of like this. Um, so if it were a book or a comic book, it would actually be laid out like this. Um, opposite to the way the flow goes. So this is about a different way of understanding narrative and time. And these are the differences that actually I'm interested in, in terms of what Ledger Book has to do. So the horse prints show the movement of the horse, but it's going through different sets of time, OK? Um, because what is this part of the image? What's going on there? Is the bow that he has. That's there. the bow lance there, absolutely. So he has lanced this crow who was in the process of shooting him with an arrow prior to going over there. So time has been bent onto the same page. And um, 
So, uh, so we see everything happening all at once, but actually um, it's happening at different times. That's the prior time. This is a continuous time. They're continually under fire as this entire set of scenery takes place. And finally, um, so this is how it would be drawn. Uh, and finally, we end up with the, what we began with, the fight between the crow and the Cheyenne person. So everything ends up emphasizing the present. The past is there. A continuous thing is there. All forms of time are compressed onto the same page. This is a completely different way of thinking about time and rendering it into a narrative than uh, a kind of Western uh, understanding of time and storytelling. Um, in addition, this is what really matters. Because that's the moment where this Cheyenne warrior shows his power, the power to dominate and defeat the Crow enemy. And in fact, it's showing something that's happening in the future. Because this guy is going to vanquish the crow. And you're seeing it at the moment the powers become manifest. So we've got past, present, and future, and continuous all put together into the same, into the same thing. So what's so interesting about ledger art then, uh, and kind of what I do with this stuff, is to try to figure out what these different ways of understanding um, history say about uh, um, L Lakota or Cheyenne or Kiowa, whoever the artists were, understanding of their um, power and um, agency in the moment, right? Because they are not running the, uh, the battle with the same frame of mind as their uh, non-Cheyenne foes. Right. They do not have the same idea about time, about why anyone would vanquish another person, about where that power from, comes from, about how you make it manifest and help you in the moment. Uh, because these things are all interconnected with um, uh, a, a way of understanding the cosmos, about the way energy emanates, about the way people collect it, and in this case, male people. Uh, for female Cheyenne, there are different ways of, of understanding and connecting with that baby. All right. So I'm going to uh, stop here with, uh, show you one more uh, slide and then just open it up to any kind of question of any sort. Um, now that we've learned how to read ledger art, have at it. What's happening here? This is another book, another artist. How do you read it? So think about the yeah. Go ahead. It looks like it looks like the native um, going to going into a battle between two um, two oppressors. Right. So these are these are are. Um, Dragoons, or you know, cavalry soldiers, and um, remember, it's right to left, right? It looks like he shot arrows at the one. There you go. So that's a past event. It's already yeah. happened. And he looks like he's threatening the next one, like your next. And person. in this case, he is hitting him with the bow. You can't kill him with the bow. So that's an honorific touch. That's counting coup. So that's the most. That's showing that you are so powerful, you do not fear death. You can even hit the person with the part of the weapon that will not kill the person to show how much power you have over that person. You have basically dominated him. Now, he may be killed the next minute, but you count coup first if you really have that kind of power. So it's the same thing. Um, time compressed, uh, past, present, and future is indicated. Yep. What does the headdress mean on the first one? The 
That's the bow <laughs> where he counted coup before. Oh. It's just like the, the, oh, the it it's just like the lads, <laughs> the, the bow lads <laughs> from the previous one. So you see there are these conventions, and once you understand them and what they're what they're saying, but again, you're seeing the pow the the moment at which his power, his innate power, the power he's collected as a person, as an honor, honor an honored person, a uh, person who has uh, worked to achieve power in hunting and, and fighting and love making and what have you, um, uh, is made manifest in, at this at this time in this battle. Um, all right. Uh, so that's me. Um, I'm open to any sorts of questions about any aspect of my my professional research and teaching life. Um, yeah. Did Did you ever get to like fully research the conquest that that you spoke of, that you spoke of? Um, fully research, no. But the first thing I ever published was about that about, was about the meeting, the meeting of uh, Moctezuma and uh, and uh, uh, Cortez. And so it wasn't the book, but that was something else that you published. Yeah, it was an art. It was my the first article that I published. It, it was trying to understand, and, and, and um, so you think it actually it shows how we get to here in a funny way. It, um, that, that meeting has been talked about, taught about, written about quite a bit. Um, and uh, it's always been presented as, um, uh, you know, either, either a meeting of equals or Cortez um, uh, showing his um, uh, uh, ability to psychologically dominate the, the, the Mexica. Um, there's a famous book by a guy named Cheslan Sodorov uh, that tries to reinterpret this meeting um, as sort of the Western way of knowing and understanding, manipulating the, the, the sort of um, uh, indigenous understanding of uh, um, a world that's overdetermined by by signs, by uh, spirits, by energy, you know. Um, and I basically sort of take that to task and show how um, Cortez is the one who's manipulating, and who he's manipulating are the Spanish in what he says. And if you were to read, if you were to understand that and read between the lines, uh, the the Mexica knew exactly what was going on, and we're not fooled by Cortez, and not, I mean, you know, the, the, uh, and I, I even look at uh, there's this ceremonial exchange of of costumes that are given to Cortez at the coast of Veracruz when he just gets there, and they're of the gods, and um, it's not like. And it's always been read by Europeans as the, the that the and this was made up later too that the Aztec were understanding that they had to uh, subject themselves to Christianity and so they were giving these in their gods in homage to the, the Christian god, um, but they were really doing what uh, he did in um, 15th century uh, and 16th century uh, Mexico or or Aztec world you. Um, uh, in, in, um, uh, in as, as ambassadors, you actually um, accord the other person the honor of uh, the power of your faith. Um, so you know I, that that was my 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 uh, entrance into the world of the conquest, and then I got interested in other conquests, like in North America and in New Mexico and in <laughs> wherever. <laughs> Um, yeah, one thing that's interesting, so that's slightly unusual about what I do, uh, is that I don't focus on one, one place or one set of people. So I've done stuff with living communities, with uh, 19th century communities, with 18th century communities. Um, yeah. Yeah. You happen to find a lot of similarities between this art and then uh, medieval art of Europe. Um, so, 
Well, I believe there is something, and so I did a lot of art history and medieval art history when I was an undergraduate. And the way in which um, medieval and Renaissance art use symbols as ways of, of understanding things that people at the time would have known. So um, allegories, uh, symbols of, of, of stories in the Bible that are, are, um, are, that are affixed to an image of Mary holding roses at the moment of the Assumption when she becomes pregnant with the, with the, um, the uh, yeah, to, you know, whatever, the, um, the, the divine spirit. Um, so that, that, that those image, those symbols uh, point to specific stories in, uh, in the Bible that are, would have been recognizable to people who grew up in the uh, medieval Catholic world. So in some way, that kind of script, that kind of cultural script, uh, spiritual and cultural script, is similar to what I'm working with here. It's a completely different you know, under world. It's a completely different um, uh, relationship between man and the cosmos that brings energy to, uh, into a person's daily life and, and, and animates what one decides to do with one's life. But, um, but humans are humans, and the way they uh, work in sort of symbolic allegory uh, with stories, that, you know, at a broad level, that's similar. And I think working on that sort of medieval science system helped me uh, try to work with uh, you know, different, different ways of, of, of signing narrative. Yeah, you know, you know um, broad experience in the world always, always goes for something that always helps. Any other questions? So I still go to uh, Royal Hondo regularly. My mother still lives there. Um, and uh, it looks not that much different from the way it looked when I was growing up, depending on how much snow. It's 7,000 feet high, so we used to have really cold winters when I was growing up. They have uh, gotten a bit warmer. Uh, sometimes you even have rain, snow and rain in the same day, which you never, you know, there was 30 degrees difference uh, back when I was growing up. Um, so. Something is warming, whether it's the globe or something else. <laughs> Any other? Um, so anyway, uh, if you uh, think, think about, uh, you know, as you get more of these stories of how people get to where they're getting, um, think about uh, those um, unscripted uh, influences that actually make probably the most difference, and I think probably more than what one actually plans to do, because what one plans to do uh, really can't take um, stock of or listen carefully to those unplanned things that are somehow um, made part of you that you are not aware of always because after all we're not omniscient uh, and we often uh, are most blind when it comes to our, self, our, our own selves, our own, our own makeup and our own passions and understanding. So, well, I think it's true that we do what we do, trying to work with both the skills that we have um, and the passions that we bring to whatever it is. How we get there is completely um, a matter of whatever, serendipity. Comments? How many people are going to now major in ethnic studies? No, I would say <laughs> <laughs> my pitch. Um, so, you know, we have a department, uh, uh, an ethnic studies department on campus that uh, uh, really looks, um, weds theory and, um, and sort of real life together to try to understand how structures of power 
um, are formed and what effect they have on people's daily lives. Um, so we use lenses of race, ethnicity, gender, and sexuality uh, to think about the way those structures are formed historically, the way they change, the way they often actually remake themselves when they look like they're changing, they're actually uh, remaking themselves in the same image. Um, and we use that to understand both the way in which past societies have, have dealt with uh, the distribution of power, but also the way in which uh, it affects um, our daily lives uh, here and now. So, um, you know, if you haven't taken an ethnic studies class, uh, do so before you leave here. Uh, and uh, I urge you to think about how whatever you're doing, that kind of lens of understanding will help you in um, going about your, your lives. How many of you have taken any ethnic studies class? Ah, well, so many of you have untold worlds to <laughs> discover. If there are no other comments or questions, thank you so much for coming.